Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. ARK Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARK. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARK or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARK to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARK Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hi, welcome to the For Your Innovation podcast. My name is Brett Winton. I direct research at ARK. And with me today, I have Ali Ehrman, who covers gene editing and gene and cell therapies for us. Hi, Ali. How are you? Hey, Brett. I'm doing well during these crazy times. How are you? I am doing well. So tell me about mRNA. What is it? Why have we been hearing so much about it? And what makes it an important tool in biology? Yeah, so mRNA is really interesting. It stands for messenger ribonucleic acid. And essentially what it does is it harnesses the body's own abilities and teaches our cells how to create, let's say, proteins that can fight off an infection. Why we're hearing a lot about it now is that it's being used for some of the SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 vaccines like Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna, Arcturus, Translate Bio, CureVac, so many of them in the pipeline. And that's why it's really been put to the forefront, especially because Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna have been approved by the FDA in the United States for emergency use authorization. So DNA is like the recipe for your body. And then RNA is the thing that kind of runs along the DNA and sees what the recipe says and then produces the protein at the end that kind of operates inside the body. What is mRNA? mRNA is a messenger RNA. So it essentially has sort of the genetic information or the genetic code or the instruction manual for your body to create whatever it needs to create. In this case, it would be the protein uh, in order to fight off a particular infection. How are these companies actually using it to, are they designing the mRNA molecule What do their platforms look like that they're able to harness this technology? Yeah, so we'll hear a ton more about that in the two podcasts that are coming up. But just to give a little bit of a taste, yes, they do create the molecule, but essentially these are really, really easy to create, which is why they're probably at the forefront. But one of the reasons that they're really easy to create is that you only need the genetic information, you package it up in a liquid nanoparticle. And so once you have the sequence of the virus, it's really easy to create this. And this is already also going to be really beneficial for variants that we see emerging, as opposed to some of the more traditional vaccines like adenovirus vaccines, which will be a little bit more complicated to create new vaccines to react to some of these strains and variants coming out. Why don't you let me know who we are actually talking to today and what they have to do with mRNA? Sure. So the first podcast will be with Stéphane Bancel, who is the CEO of Moderna. Obviously, they have an approved COVID-19 vaccine. So we were very interested in talking to them about that, as well as some of their other interesting pipeline assets, like for myocardial ischemia. Joe Payne is the second podcast. He's the CEO of Arcturus Therapeutics. They are currently in their phase two for their mRNA vaccine for COVID. And mRNA, we just really think is important because it could potentially save the world from this pandemic that we're currently suffering from. But it's also interesting from a long-term perspective for other potential therapeutics that aren't being focused as much right now. mRNA is really a technology. It's a fundamental tool. It's being used for rare diseases, oncology, and of course, for infectious diseases. All of these trials mostly are still in development or in clinical trials. In this discussion today, we talk a little bit about pipelines, what's coming up, including cystic fibrosis, OTC deficiency, RSV, influenza, myocardial ischemia, as I mentioned. And of course, we focus a lot on COVID-19 and the future of mRNA therapeutics. 
it's a, an important platform in this particular pandemic moment and also has potential implications for how we develop in treatments for diseases over the next decade. Yeah, and one of the interesting implications that I see is Moderna and Arcturus both have a flu vaccine in their pipelines. And I think something that could be really interesting is, as we know, the flu has about a 40 to 60 percent efficacy rate right now. And that's because the flu mutates very easily and a lot. So the flu that you see at the beginning of the season is quite different from the flu that you see at the end. But with the traditional vaccines, it's harder to kind of create new vaccines really quickly to maybe be altered to attack some of those different mutations or variants. And so if potentially it's a possibility for the future, and if we need to have COVID-19 vaccines every year, maybe a flu slash COVID-19 vaccine could be possible. And that could maybe help with the efficacy of the flu vaccine. That would be nice. So not only do we get rid of this particularly deadly pandemic, we also get rid of the flu in one stroke. Well, I look forward to hearing the conversations. Let's move right to the first interview. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Welcome. Well, thank you, Ali, for having me. Yes, we're very excited. So just to delve right in, because there's so much really interesting material to cover. So as we know, mRNA vaccines were basically thought of, created, developed, and tested in a really record amount of time. Prior to this, the fastest vaccine approval was in 1967, and that was for the mumps. And that took about four years. We believe there are many reasons why SARS-CoV-2 mRNA vaccines were developed quicker. Some of those include the funding, the quick pace of the sequencing of the virus, that being put online, operation warp speed, etc. But is there anything really fundamental about mRNA vaccines that may make them quicker to develop and potentially even cheaper? than other vaccine types like the more traditional killed, live attenuated, or synthetic viruses? Yes, I think the punchline to me is the fact that mRNA being an information molecule, we basically have a platform. And if you think about it, we use genetic information coming from sequencing as raw material. We know the Chinese put the sequence of a virus online on January 11 in 48 hours we lock down the design of a vaccine. And the vaccine that has been approved by the FDA in December is exactly the vaccine the team designed in 48 hours. And if you compare that to traditional technology, it is unthinkable. And then we went into the clinic in 42 days. And that's possible because, again, this is a platform. The chemistry to make the mRNA molecule is the same for all of our vaccines. The manufacturing process is the same for all of our vaccine in the same machine done by the same teams. And same thing for the lipid, the formulation that we put around it. And so I think what you see here, that is such a disruption to the technologies of old vaccine that you mentioned, is that we are moving from the world of analog to the world of digital with a platform that is using information. That's really, really helpful. And you mentioned actually about the delivery or the lipid nanoparticles. So I'm curious if you can talk a little bit more about how the body breaks down that lipid nanoparticle or that container that the vaccine is in, especially in the context of repeat dosing and with potentially even future therapeutics not only limited to the COVID-19 vaccine. Do you think there are any other sort of promising delivery mechanisms in the pipeline or are you very excited about lipid nanoparticles? We are very excited about lipid nanoparticles or LNPs. What I want to caution people is that LNPs are not LNPs. It's a class of chemistry because it basically means it's a lipid, i.e. it's fat, nano, it's small, and particle, particle. That's all it says. And so what I mean by that, it's a bit like when you talk about a diesel engine. You have cars that can go and do the 24-hour Le Mans and don't break, cars that are very beautiful, cars that are very cheap, they are still cars. And so what we've learned about LNPs that we have been working on for most of our history is the old generation of lipids that some companies are still using, not Moderna, are actually very slow to process by the body. I'm talking days. Some old lipid could take up to six days or more in terms of a half-life. So you can think about when you inject them, they will stick around for a week or so. 
The lipid that is in our COVID vaccine is a lipid that our team developed and invented from a chemical structure standpoint, and we have IP on it, that basically was designed by the team to be biodegradable. Its half-life is a few hours. So basically, you get injected, the lipid does its job, it protects the mRNA, gets it into the cell, and then it literally falls apart into the cell. The team designed it backward to think about what enzymes are naturally available in the cell that could basically degrade the lipid. And they designed the lipid that, again, the chemical structure, like chemistry, like you do, and really designed it backward, that it will literally fall apart as soon as it has done its job, which is to bring the mRNA inside the cell. That's really helpful. And I think that is also kind of bringing us back to safety in general. So we know mRNA is a genetic component, and it's sort of wrapped in this LMP delivery for Moderna. It doesn't use more of the traditional methods like a live attenuated killed or a synthetic virus. It also degrades in the body like the LMP. So because of all this, do you think that this is a safer type of vaccine? And then even broader for just therapy, do you think this will be just a safer way of administering therapies for people in the future? I do think so, Ali. And since we started Moderna, I've been always extremely focused on safety. I train at Eli Lilly. And like any big pharmaceutical company, 90% of our drug used to fail in the clinic. And when you look at the industry, like 40 plus years ago, where drugs will fail for safety, but sometimes for lack of efficacy, given the scientific progress we have achieved as an industry and the academic world in the last 40 years, 20 years, the case where you see a drug not working for lack of efficacy is getting really rare. It happens still but it's really rare. So basically, it means that most drugs die in clinical trials because of safety. And so as we built Moderna, I was always paranoid about safety. I mean, as you can imagine, you know, we were taking a bet on the new technology with incredible, at the time, 10 years ago, unknown unknowns. And so I pushed the team really hard, saying, look, we're not going to work on this technology for 10 years if it's going to fail. Let's do all the really hard experiment. Let's understand how this works. And so some of the work we did in the early year, including with Academic Lab, was things like, does the mRNA get into the nucleus? As you know, the nucleus protects the DNA. And it was a big question for us is, could you get our synthetic mRNA into the nucleus? Because you could then potentially, like gene therapy, have a long-term risk of safety of integration into the DNA of a patient. And so this was really worrying me tremendously. And so we ran a lot of work including microscopy work where you will tag the synthetic mRNA and follow them in cells and do kind of time-lapse movies and stuff like that, very elaborative science. And we showed time and time and time again that all Moderna mRNA, the way it is done, does not get into the nucleus, which is very important for long-term safety. The other piece is the mRNA molecule that we design, which is, again, different from other companies that are in the field. It has its peak protein production at around six hours and at around 48 hours it's completely gone it's degraded inside the cell it is chopped up in pieces of a four basic component the nucleotide you know the four letters of life that basically are actually reused by the cell to make over genetic material uh, but the molecular mRNA is, is gone in 48 hours after injection and as we just spoke about the LNP the lipid the lipid of Moderna because of how we designed it a few hours after injection is also gone. So I think this is actually potentially a very safe technology if developed correctly. That's why not all mRNAs are alike. I go back to my car analogy. The other piece too, I think that sometimes people underappreciate is the fact that the raw material that we use is genetic information that exists in nature. If you look over the SARS-CoV-2, what was our raw material? The sequence of a full-length spike protein that we did not invent. We didn't come up with that thing. We just took it from nature. If you think about our therapeutic program, we have a very exciting program, for example, in phase two with AstraZeneca called VEGF, V-E-G-F, which is the name of a protein that is currently injected in people's heart after a heart attack with a biological hypothesis to create brand new blood vessel in the heart after an infarct to revascularize the heart, 
like regenerative medicine in your own body. The peak data look fantastic, preclinical, been published in Nature. The phase one data run by AZ show a very pristine safety profile. There was no tox, no liver enzyme, no cytokine, nothing. And shown in the phase 1b, increase in blood flow in humans. So that is very encouraging. Again, it is not the proof of a concept that's a phase 2 ongoing. But again, if you think about this drug, what was our raw material? The full sequence of a VEGF protein, which is in your DNA, in my DNA, is available online because the entire human genome is online. And so I think what people also sometimes underappreciate is our technology basically is a cassette that we build by a lot of building blocks that then you just drop in a set of instructions. But those instructions exist in nature. So the protein that is made by the synthetic mRNA inside a human is not a new chemical entity that has never been in human and is going to create tox that is unknown. It is a protein that has been in humans for hundreds of thousands of years. So it's pretty safe. That's really interesting. One of the things that I was thinking about when I looked at the differentiations in doses between different mRNA companies is that Moderna's dose is a little bit larger than some of the others at 100 micrograms. Is there any reason to think that maybe a smaller dose might be safer or there's some correlation with dose level and safety? I was reading that Operation Warp Speed was potentially requesting trials for a smaller dose of the vaccine to see if maybe if you half the dose, if it was 50 micrograms, that maybe that would be a good option. And that could just be for manufacturing and scalability reasons. But I was wondering if that's maybe something you'd consider and if safety is at all a consideration here. So there are a lot of good questions. So let me try to unpack them. The dose of 100 microgram is indeed higher than the dose, let's say, of a Pfizer vaccine at 30 microgram. And the key reason is we could safely dose 100 microgram or phase one was 25, 100, and 250 microgram. They could not. If you look at their phase one data at 100 microgram, they had some toxicity issue. I think this is because of a manufacturing process. This was not our first vaccine in a clinic. That was actually our 10th vaccine in a clinic. So over the years, we have upgraded our manufacturing process. It's actually now the sixth version of the vaccine manufacturing process. And our lipid, as we discussed a few minutes ago, Ali, our lipid is biodegradable. And so we could push the dose, which we think is really important for duration. Because if you think about it, what is quite unique with these vaccine developments is that because of a pandemic, they have been approved in record time. We have efficacy data for what I would call short-term efficacy. Because by the time we looked at the data, I mean, all the different vaccine makers, it's not with a, you don't look at efficacy a year or two after injection, you look at efficacy more for two after injection. And so if you think about how the immune system works, what basically the first dose does of a virus, you have never been exposed to a virus your body is naive to, is it trigger the immune system, starts to make antibodies, but the boost is actually very important. If you look at the data of vaccine like CMV or cytomegalovirus vaccine, for which we have multi-year of data, what you see is that when you boost, you get between half a log and a log more antibodies. That's going to be, of course, very important for duration because antibodies are then going to wane. So what it does, it really pushes out the production of antibodies versus a single dose. And so the way to think about it, which is, I don't think that we have seen yet the true differentiation of a product because of the time frame we have looked at. I think the 100 microgram dose that we picked because we could pick it because the vaccine was safe at that dose, unlike others, I think the proof of the value of this vaccine will be more shown in the mid to long term in terms of duration. So, of course, we'll have to be patient and see the data, but that is our scientific hypothesis, which I think will be vindicated with time that being able to give a higher dose because our technology allows it will help us have a stronger product. So you bring up a really interesting point here, and that is the immune response. That has been something that I think has been really having people scratch their heads. One thing is sort of the cellular versus humoral response. So there's been some data to suggest, one example is David Wiley's prospective study on T-cells, and a number of the T-cells being associated with protection from COVID-19. It was a pretty small sample size study, but they did show that 
during a median of about 118 days of follow-up, there were about 20 patients that had lower T-cell responses that developed COVID-19 versus none in the population with high T-cell responses. So I'm just curious on sort of your perspective in terms of cellular immunity versus humoral immunity. We know in the Moderna data, we saw some T-cell activation as well as some strong NABs data or neutralizing antibody data. So I'm curious on your perspective of what you think may or may not be important in terms of a long and durable response. Yeah, that's a very good question. And as you know, we as a collective scientific community do not understand 100% yet how the immune system really works. We have a lot of hypotheses. We've learned a lot in the last 10, 20 years, but we still have a lot to learn. We think it's most probably both. If you look at duration, which we have shown with this vaccine and other vaccines, I mentioned the CMV with very long kind of duration. It's really hard to explain the duration without the T-cell component. Another program I will think about to understand the mechanism of what we do is our personalized cancer vaccine program, which uses the same lipid as the COVID vaccine, the same chemistry for the mRNA, and the same manufacturing process. So those products are very, very similar. And what we've shown in cancer patients is the ability to activate T-cells for T-cells that were not activated naturally before starting the treatment. At the same time, we all know, and Dr. Tony Fauci has spoke about it a lot, that neutralizing antibody are an extremely important component, as the name says, to neutralize the virus so it doesn't replicate in your body. And so I think the answer, like always with biology, is not simple, it's complex. I think it's most probably both components. Now, if you ask me what's the weight of B cell, what's the weight of T cell, I don't think we really know. But both exist in the case of our vaccine, and I would say that both are important. And why haven't we been able to look through the scientific community or past literature to figure out what has been important for other vaccines and for immunity? Can we not look to that as at least a guide for what could potentially be the most important in terms of protection and immunity going forward? Yes, very much so. And the reason it has not been done consistently, I would say, is a few things. Lack of analytical methods in the past. And then you don't have a blood samples anymore of those participants in clinical trial, you know, five, 10 years ago. So you cannot do the experiment. The fact that working on T-cell is very complicated and very expensive. So a lot of time people don't do all the thorough work because you will lose a lot of precious time in your clinical trial development of your product. And so it goes back a bit to what I was alluding to, which is we should not forget that we are still, I believe, in the early days of truly understanding the mechanism of the immune system, because it's a very complex system with incredible feedback loops. But I think as we are making as an industry and a scientific community progress in that field, what is exciting for us that have a technology that is basically able to drug any protein target in a matter of weeks, given the platform we have, is we can go and test those new scientific hypotheses as scientists published them in peer-reviewed journal, and we can test them very quickly. And so I'm quite optimistic that in the next few years, the pace of learning of the immune system is going to accelerate tremendously. And speaking of learning, we are seeing a lot of new strains of SARS-CoV-2, one that potentially originated in the UK, another in South Africa. Do you think that the current vaccines will work on these new strains and attack the spike protein? Or do you think that this is going to need a new vaccine? And what kind of gives you confidence based on that? Yeah, those are great questions. And I know the media is interested in those two because we have the most recently talked about. But we should not forget that since January, the initial virus has been mutating quite a lot. As everybody knows by now, this is an mRNA virus. So because it's a single strand of nucleic acid, it's highly unstable, like the flu or other mRNA virus, and like DNA viruses that are quite stable because of the double strain. And so we have had teams monitoring mutations since January. One of the many amazing things that has happened this year in terms of collaboration across industry and academia has been the sharing of data of mutation in real time. And so we've been following all that very closely. For the two mutations you mentioned, we've done like we always do in silico analysis on computers of a structure 
of those new viruses and the protein their genetic material produces. We believe at this stage from our silico analysis that it is unlikely, and so I put low percentage point, huh, that the mutation will impact materially the efficacy of a vaccine. We are, as we always do, currently working on human blood from people vaccinated with our vaccine to confirm this scientifically. And we, of course, communicate that when we have a final confirmation. And the piece to understand why I think this is the case is we should not forget, again, the science here, which is the spike protein is actually a very, very large protein. And the Monana vaccine codes for the full length spike protein, which is around four kilobytes. It's four KB. Most protein in the human body are one to two KB. And so it's a very large protein, meaning when you inject the mRNA for a full length protein coded like we do, you basically make that protein in your body. But because it's so large, your immune system is going to make not one antibody, like the monoclonal antibody recombinant world makes us think about. Your immune system is going to make a soup of a lot of antibodies, binding to many epitopes, many different structure of that very large molecule. And because it's so large, you're going to have a lot of antibodies made. If it was a very small structure with only one epitope, you would get one antibody made, but it's not the case. And so even like in the case of South Africa strain, if you have two or three mutations on the spike protein, because it is so long, you're going to have a lot of antibodies who are going to bind, made by the vaccine, going to bind to the new virus and will neutralize it. And so we are following very closely. We are validating through plasma, human plasma work that our silicon analysis is correct and confirmed of no impact on efficacy. I would say in a worst case scenario, if down the road, because you have mutations from a mutation from a mutation and you have basically a big drift happening from the initial published genomic strain of January of 2020, you could see a world where you have to make a new mRNA. We have talked about it since the beginning of this project. But I would say this is yet another thing that will play to the strength of mRNA compared to other technology. It will totally dwarf older technology because we can make in... 30 to 40 days, a clinical grade product for the new strain. I remind you, we made our first mRNA earlier in 2020 for a phase one dose by the NIH in 42 days from sequence. So this is not science fiction. This is something we have already done. And you could combine them. I believe personally that the boost that we're going to have to be giving to people over time for SARS-CoV-2 virus are going to be different seasonal strain, where basically you might have a couple of strains because of a mutation drift that you give. And when you get every year, every two years, every three years, it is too early to know we don't have enough information on the clinical trials and real life experiment on the millions of people we already got on our vaccine. But as you're going to build that scientific knowledge, we might say, let's say in 2022, what you need is a vaccine that has free mRNA in it, one with the original strain because it's still circulating. And then it's the South Africa fifth generation of strain. I mean, the fifth mutation away from the current South Africa. And then the UK seventh generation mutation away. And that's a product you put on the market for a boost, a single dose product, where basically you put very low dose of a free, let's say you could put 33 micrograms of each of those free to a similar 100 microgram total mass. And you get a product that is adapted to the moment. So I think that this is how we're going to deal with this issue, which is over time, the mutation will have an impact on efficacy. It's really hard to tell you, not knowing the future mutation, when it will happen, which generation away, you will need a new mRNA. But again, given the strength of mRNA, we have in the clinic, on its way to phase three, the CMV vaccine, this product, as in every vial, six mRNA in the vial. And so if you think about it, the notion to put three, four, five, six mRNA in the 22 version or 2023 version of a COVID vaccine for a company like Moderna is a no-brainer. We will follow the biology. This is another thing that I think is really fascinating about this technology, which I have never seen in my career in pharmaceutical before, which is you can design your product to spec, like in the tech world where you start from what problem are you solving for and you design backward 
your product, which is how it's done in most industries, the way the cars are designed and houses are built by architects and so on. You start by the end game and then you go backward. In the pharmaceutical industry, it has never been the case. You are basically scientists coming with a drug that binds to a receptor. And then they turn around to the commercial guys and say, this is the drug. Good luck. Make the best out of it. And that's why I think mRNA technology is going to flip on its head the industry in terms of disruption. Is we're able to say, okay, what do you need to get the right drug working safely? That's what we did for CMV. We didn't come and say, we need six mRNA. No, we said, what is the right biology to make a vaccine that's going to get approved because it's going to work safely? That's how we started the CMV journey. And then as we talk to a lot of infectiologists around the world, look at a lot of previous failed CMV vaccine because there's no CMV vaccine approved today on the market. What we learned is that we needed to do two protein complex to work. We need a protein called GB, which is pretty straightforward, which is why it was done by the pharma industry as a protein recombinant. But then you need another component, which is called the pentamer. And as the name suggests, the pentamer is made of five protein. So good luck with a recombinant to make five different protein to purify them and to have them self-assemble. This is a kind of really very complex thing to do. But with mRNA, given we don't do the heavy lifting, the body does it because the body makes the protein. We basically coded five mRNA coding for each component of a pentamer. And we demonstrated and published that we make a full functional pentamer in humans and that the human body, once your immune system sees the pentamer structure, it does go and make an antibody binding specifically to the pentamer and neutralizing the pentamer. So that's the type of thing that I think is extremely disruptive. And I don't think the world has yet realized all the different permutation and combination that we can use to be able to make extremely efficacious products because we do engineering and product design like it should be done backward from the solution and not forward from the best molecule you can give me in the labs. And I need to do the best in the clinic and on the market. That's actually really interesting and helpful, and especially the part about the different strains and how we might need boosters. One of the things that sort of strikes me then is, you know, in in the data for the Moderna vaccine, there appeared to be about a 3x decline over 80 days from peak response. So I'm curious, do you think that means, and even with the idea of these new mutations and maybe potential boosts needed, Do you think that the vaccine will need to be maybe an annual vaccine or a one shot plus its booster could be protected for maybe a longer period of time? Or do you think that the fact that we haven't seen a massive amounts of reinfections means that maybe the vaccines are actually going to be working longer and give stronger protection, given that we've now seen people who've had the vaccine for quite a number of months? I think it's still a bit too early to tell. My hypothesis is younger people, most probably, if you get a prime and a boost of, let's say, Moderna vaccine, should have a pretty good duration of protection. We don't have enough data to really determine is it for life or is it for five years or three years or something like that. We'll have to learn it the hard way by looking at the clinical evidence and the data. I think in the elderly, potentially, or people with a weaker immune system, like with comorbidity factors, it might be a shorter time frame. But as you said, at the same time, we're going to have mutation of SARS-CoV-2. This virus is going to stay with humans forever, like flu. That is our beliefs as a company. It's going to keep mutating because it's an mRNA virus. I always have to go back to the basic science because I don't know any other way to have scientific and business hypothesis about what's going to happen. And so when you put all those things together, you're like, look, we will end up with a seasonal boost product. The frequency of boosting is too early to tell. It might be different based on age. We're going to have to learn that. But the good news, again, with mRNA is we can do anything that is required. If 10 years from now, people need a boost with 12 mRNA to protect them holistically, well, we will be able to do that. There is nothing in the technology that prevents us to follow the biology. That makes sense. And I've been curious about, I've been reading a lot about how some countries like the UK are thinking of potentially delaying the second dose of the vaccine. They want to get more people vaccinated and have them have their one dose to offer some protection. I've also read that they may mix companies for the first and second dose. So you might have a Moderna 
vaccine the first dose and maybe a Pfizer vaccine the second, or if others are approved similarly. To me, this seems like it would be quite a reckless decision just because we have clinical trial processes for a reason. And so we should follow those protocols for what we know to have about a 95% efficacy. Do you think this strategy could potentially be a good one, having more people get that one dose for some protection, which could be about 50% effective if you have just that one dose? Or do you think it makes more sense to steer clear of that and follow the protocols that we've known to be tested? I'm going to give you a two-part answer to that excellent question. The first one is exactly like you say, what we know today, the label we got from the FDA is two doses, four weeks apart of 100 microgram. And that's what we know from the clinical trial. That's the label we have from the agency. And that's the only product that as CEO of Moderna, I can talk about until there is further data to talk about something else. The piece that I want to make as a second point, which is more in reaction to your question and what's happening in some countries, is just the reality of where we are. We are living through a pandemic that is devastating, that has not happened in 100 years. We lost yesterday in the US 4,000 Americans. There is one out of 30 people in London that have SARS-CoV-2. I've heard horror stories through friends in London that basically people are being treated in ambulance because there's no more beds in hospitals in London downtown London, that there's no more oxygen in some hospital to help people with. So if I was a public health doctor, which I am not, if I was a head of a government or regulatory agency, which I am not, I will ask myself those questions because this is not normal times. We are at war against this virus. It's only January 7th. It's going to be a very long, very, very painful winter. And if I was in those jobs, I will be asking myself, what's the best poison? Do I keep what I have now, which I know for sure from a rigorous scientific process? Or do I try, like in wartime, to find solutions with bandage by giving half a dose, by giving only prime and not boost? Those are extremely complicated decisions because there is no data. So I think they're using the clinical knowledge. They are engaging infectious disease experts, immune system experts, and so on. And that's why I think we're observing from the outside is governments and regulators and public health experts trying to make the best of an extremely difficult situation they have to deal with. And they know that every day goes by, more people will die and that they need to do the best they can. So it's it's a long answer, but I think that's a bit of a reality of what they are facing. Again, as I said, from a company standpoint, the message is very clear. The regulator has approved what we've tested in the clinic, and we're going to stick with this to those 100 microgram for now. That makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of challenges that we're dealing with. For example, the World Economic Forum also did a study, which was published in November, and it showed there's a hesitancy in taking a vaccine for SARS-CoV-2, and it's actually growing. So 73% of people were willing to take the vaccine as opposed to 77 just three months earlier. And health experts have been quoted saying that these numbers are pretty significant and they may even be significant enough to compromise the effectiveness of a vaccine to manage the disease and end lockdown and, as you say, end this sort of horrific pandemic. So how much of the population do you think we actually need to get vaccinated in order to go back to our daily lives? And do you think there's a possibility that maybe we could have a combination of people taking the vaccine and some form of herd immunity that could be achieved if not everyone is willing and takes the vaccine. It's tough to do precisely, but with two 95% approved vaccine, you can do the math backward. 60-70% of the population will give you herd immunity. The question is going to be down the road, what's the efficacy of the other vaccine? As you know, the J&J vaccine, the Astra vaccine, we don't know the efficacy yet precisely. When we know that, that will, of course, change the mix at the country level. We also, of course, have a lot of people that have been infected. 20 million recorded in the US. My guess, if you look at CDC estimation, it might be 40 to 50 million people that have been, since the beginning, contaminated. Some have not been tested because there was big testing capacity issue in the spring. And a lot of people are asymptomatic. And so I think most probably you're going to get a bit of both. You might need also to boost back people that have got natural infection. So I think it depends on what time point you look at, but that's a bit how I think about it, Ali. 
I think that makes sense. And just, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't mention another challenge that mRNA has, which is that it's quite unstable. And so that means that it typically needs to be kept at very cold temperatures. So how have you at Moderna dealt with this problem and sort of the supply chain issues that come with trying to pump out so many vaccines in such a short amount of time? And are there any other challenges that are pretty common for mRNA that you're dealing with, not only maybe in the vaccine space, but also in the therapeutics industry? Because as I know, through your pipeline, you're working on rare diseases and oncology as well. Yeah. So the one that is the most important is the one you mentioned, which is temperature. mRNA is a molecule that does not like heat, which is why if you don't want to have a virus on your body, just spend some time in the sun, you're going to be good. And so we've worked really hard and invested a lot of money and a lot of talent to get to where we are, which is why if you look at the world today, you have two mRNA vaccines that are authorized in the U.S., with extremely different supply chain constraints. And the reason we're at minus 20 and not minus 70 is investment in science over the years, investment in process development, process manufacturing process is really important. And we have, we should not forget, 30 days, not a few days, 30 days at 2 to 5 Celsius, a regular fridge temperature like you store in insulin and other products. We are working toward improving that. We have some very good ideas in our teams from a scientific standpoint, how to get there. And we keep pushing the envelope. If you ask me, no, do I believe we could be able to get down the road an mRNA product stored in a regular fridge for a year or two? I believe so. Is it going to be in six months from now or two years from now? It's hard to be precise, but we're going to solve a scientific problem one after the other, file a lot of patents to protect our innovation and going to keep pushing the envelope. Okay, thank you so, so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ali. Stay healthy. Bye-bye. You too. We really appreciate the time that we were able to have with Stefan. And now we're going to talk to Joe Payne from Arcturus Therapeutics. A really interesting conversation about mRNA technology in general and where the Arcturus pipeline is headed. So tune in for that now and we look forward to getting your feedback. Hey, Joe, thanks so much for joining us on our FYI for your innovation podcast today. Hey, it's good to be with you, Ali, and glad to chat with you. This is going to be fun. Great. So giving you an easy, interesting question, I learned that you know American Sign Language. So I was wondering how you learned that. And I'm really interested on your website, there's everyone from your management team, it looks like, has doing your corporate kind of pitch in a different language. So just really interested to hear how that came about and how you learned American Sign Language. Arcturus is based in San Diego, California. California is well known to be a diverse population. And we've had the opportunity to hire many scientists and in the different groups and auxiliaries at Arcturus with capabilities in a whole slew of different languages. And so we thought since we're in the process of approaching many different countries with respect to the COVID-19 vaccine, that would present an opportunity to showcase our employees and the team at Arcturus and their capabilities around different languages. So that's how that all came about. And we have 20 plus languages here at Arcturus. So we filmed them speaking about Arcturus, about our vaccine candidate in different languages. And I'm fluent in American Sign Language. This is because, well, first of all, both of my grandparents were deaf. And so at a very young age, I got exposure to sign language and was interested in learning more about it. I had the opportunity to become fluent in it through a service opportunity at the Tennessee School for the Deaf. I had the opportunity to actually volunteer and teach chemistry and science utilizing sign language. I became fluent in it over a span of a couple years through other service opportunities in the New York area and in Tennessee. So it presented an opportunity for me to talk about Arcturus and the COVID vaccine using my hands and using sign language. And that's what we did. Joe, that is fascinating. I wasn't anticipating that answer. That was actually really fascinating. Now to take a totally different direction here. Obviously, Arcturus has gotten quite a lot of attention for their mRNA technology. And mRNA technology has certainly been in the media quite a bit right now. And that's obviously due to the current pandemic going on right now. And mRNA is a possible vaccine. So I'm curious, 
If we hadn't had a pandemic, how long do you think these vaccines would have taken to actually develop and get approved? Because as we know, these were all kind of vaccines that were pretty much in pipeline for most companies. And do you think that mRNA vaccines could ever potentially be the new standard for vaccines? Well, there's a lot there. But yes, the pandemic has definitely accelerated science, innovation, and our path to approval as a community of messenger RNA therapeutics and vaccines companies. Whenever there's urgency, there's the opportunity to advance programs very quickly in order to address the unmet medical need. But having said that, if it wasn't for the pandemic, messenger RNA is going to move very quickly anyway. The concept of clock speed, that's the term that's utilized for how fast we can advance a drug or a therapeutic from inception, from the idea to commercialization. And clock speed for messenger RNA therapeutics is very quick, much more efficient relative to small molecule technologies or biologics. There's a few reasons for this, but it was definitely showcased and put on display with respect to the COVID-19 vaccine process because there was hundreds of companies and many dozens of different technologies that were brought forward to address the COVID vaccine demand. And several of the first moving companies are messenger RNA technology related because of this, the simplicity and the ease of which you can design these vaccines in a short period of time and evaluate them quickly. So it was nice to see that prove out in real time this past year. And you mentioned there were other options on the market as well. So Johnson & Johnson is one of those, the adenovirus vaccine, so obviously not mRNA. I'm curious, they're the only other potential one-shot dose vaccine on the market as opposed to Arcturus Therapeutics. We know that their data is supposed to be coming out by the end of January. I'm curious if you could tell me what you sort of anticipate seeing from it. What do you think maybe is an acceptable efficacy rate for a one-dose vaccine? And if that differs at all, maybe from the two-shot vaccine efficacy rates? We know, of course, that Dr. Anthony Fauci has said that we have enough data to actually assess the efficacy for J&J. And we also know that the vaccine was able to produce some form of immune response that lasts about 71 days. A lot of great comments there. I can jump in. First of all, with J&J, great company. They have a great infectious disease division. We're fortunate to be working with them on hepatitis B in another partnership at Arcturus for several years. So we have nothing but high respect for J&J and their team. I think you can expect their vaccine to be effective and safe and a single shot vaccine as well. At least that's my expectation. And I hope that that proves out here shortly. Single shot is absolutely essential to progress these types of technologies forward. It increases compliance, it increases convenience, and it helps accelerate our path to herd immunity. For those that are not aware, it's just uh, there's a percentage of people that do not come in for the second administration for a two-shot vaccine. And that means that the vaccine is ultimately less effective if compliance drops. So you can define the success of a vaccine is the efficacy multiplied by the percent compliance. And for a single shot vaccine, compliance is 100%. So it's not only convenient, but it makes a more successful vaccine. With respect to what sort of efficacy you'll need to see, there's a couple of references that I can cite rather than express my own opinion. The WHO expert ad hoc team wrote a New England Journal of Medicine article addressing that question. And they said that if a single shot vaccine is 70% effective, then that would be a premier vaccine, a vaccine that would be highly successful. Can a single shot vaccine exceed 70%? We're going to learn from J&J and from Arcturus on that. And I think there's theoretical rationale and reasons to suggest that the success rates or efficacy rates could be higher than that. But if you couple that efficacy rate with 100% compliance, then you have something that can be distributed efficiently and establish herd immunity more quickly. And that's a desire of all the countries we're talking to with respect to their citizens. 
That's a really good point. And I think one of the large debates that's been ongoing with the vaccine space right now is what is more important? Is it cellular immunity? Is it humoral immunity? Or is it maybe a combination of the two? And one thing that I found really interested is uh, David Wiley's research, which he did a study. It was a prospective study. I'm sure you know it well, but just for others listening in, it looked at T cell numbers, which would be cellular immunity. And it looked at how that was being associated with protection against SARS-CoV-2. And although this study had a very small sample size, it really had some compelling evidence to show that T cell activation might be really, really important. So it showed that during a median of 118 days follow up, there were 20 patients with lower T cell responses that developed COVID 19. And that was as opposed to none in the population with the high T cell responses. So, my question, Joe, and really interested to hear your thoughts on this ongoing debate that's happening right now. Do you think this shows that cellular immunity, including that T cell activation, may be really important for a durable response? As we know, in the Moderna, Pfizer data, along with BioNTech, we saw some T cell activation. We also saw some strong NABs or neutralizing antibody data. So with Arcturus, we saw a really strong cellular response. And so I'm curious to hear what your thought is on the differentiation in this ongoing debate. Great. Well, humoral immunity and cellular immunity is exactly what it proclaims to be, immunity. Both are great. Both are fantastic. Both are protective. And everybody just wants to be protected and immune from the COVID-19 virus. That's what everybody wants. There's different ways to get there. With humoral immunity, these are high levels of antibodies. It just takes two shots to establish that. The early movers are showing high antibody levels with the administration of two shots of vaccine, a prime followed by a boost, and then you can get high levels, and and those are going to be likely protective, and that's encouraging. With respect to T-cell immunity, I'm glad you brought up the Wiley study out of the United Kingdom. Thousands of people were tracked. These are frontline workers. It's the only study that I know of where you see 100% protection over a period of four months from a group of people where they had a median T cell number of 120, and this is 120 spots per million blood cells, and they use an Ellis spot assay to get this number. That's encouraging because in our Ellis spot assay, which has some differences, but it's still an Ellis spot assay, we counted uh, 530 spots per million PBMCs, and we view that as very encouraging. And that was after a single administration of five micrograms of our vaccine. So if T cell immunity is desired, and the scientific community and people understand that to be protective, then that should be good news for Arcturus because that's what we've observed preclinically. There's other benefits to T cell immunity that you've touched on, and I think it's worthwhile just going over them. You mentioned durability. The theoretical prediction was T cells are going to last longer than antibodies because both are protective. You want both, but T cells last longer. Well, that's now been proven out in multiple publications, uh, peer reviewed publication recently in science, I can reference, and just a few weeks ago, showed very clearly that T cells last three to five months, say an average of four months, and that's six times longer than the half life of some of the antibody studies that we're looking at. So, antibodies and T cells are both great. T cells happen to last longer. It looks like approximately six times longer, which is important to know. T cells, when the topic of these variant coverage, that that's the topic of the day, actually. Here we are, and there's a lot of news about different variants out of the United Kingdom, the South African variant. There's dozens of these now coming forward. And a T cell immunity, theoretically, should have wider variant coverage than antibody immunity or humoral immunity. And that's going to be more and more understood as time goes on. But uh, referencing the same UK study, there's people that have high T cells because of the common cold, for example, not because of exposure to COVID. So these people are protected from COVID-19 because they have T cells for coronaviruses, just general coronaviruses. So that isn't a mutation. That's a completely different pathogen. And yet you're seeing people being potentially protected from COVID-19 
from their previous exposure to a common cold, for example, and having T cells in your body that protect. It's, it's an interesting topic that people are going to understand more and more, but you see that 30, 40, 50% of people that get exposure to COVID are asymptomatic, meaning they don't show any symptoms. And that may be in large part because they've had exposure to the common cold, they've developed T cells that are protective and protective for a wide spectrum of pathogens, a wide spectrum of coronaviruses. So it's going to be interesting to learn not just about the durability of T cells, but the scope of variant coverage could be an advantage of cellular immunity. Another advantage of cellular immunity is with respect to this concept of T cell exhaustion. Exhaustion is a term used in the medical community, meaning the T cells don't work anymore. And in those that have passed away from COVID, there's been significant observations of T cell exhaustion in these people. So at the time of passing, they have high levels of antibodies, but their T cells are exhausted. But if you look at COVID-19 survivors, 100% of them in one study showed T cells. 100% had CD4 T cells. And on top of that, 70% showed CD8 T cells. So if we want to be COVID-19 survivors, there seems to be a nice correlation there with CD4 and CD8 T cells in COVID survivors, where in those that pass, there seems to be a well-documented T cell exhaustion that we can reference. I've been over-answering your question, Ali. No, this is great. You can interrupt me at any time, but there's also interest in looking at the viral vector transition market, I call it. There's a lot of great vaccines and countries that are developing vaccines that use a virus to deliver the vaccine. And they work great. They're going to be safe and effective. However, upon exposure to this virus, the delivery system that delivers the vaccine, the recipients of these viral vector vaccines have memory. They memorize and learn and they see that virus. So the next time they see it, their body will have an immune response to it and attack it before it does its job. So there's concerns about redosability of viral vector vaccines if you use the exact same virus or the viral vector it's called. So there's been studies now on how do we transition all of these recipients because there's going to be hundreds of millions of people, maybe even a billion people that receive a viral vector vaccine. How are we going to transition this enormous market to maintain and boost them on their annual shock, for example. And there's been another study that I can reference out of Gritstone. Our friends at Gritstone, they're another great company. They showcase their self-amplifying mRNA technology, similar to Arcturus's self-amplifying mRNA vaccine, and that worked extremely well, very well in primates, complementing a viral vector technology, meaning the first dose was a viral vector vaccine, followed by a boost of self-amplifying mRNA that worked very well. So it's going to be interesting to see not only self-amplifying mRNA vaccines complement and help transition all the viral vector vaccines, but the immunity behind it is cellular immunity as well, in addition to humoral immunity. And on that note, while I pause about cellular immunity, I do want to point out that the Arcturus vaccine showcased 100% seropositivity with respect to antibodies, binding and neutralizing antibody uh, titer levels. The levels were modest, however. They weren't very high like Moderna and Pfizer prime boost vaccines, for example. But we still showed 100% seropositivity, and that's very good. It just helps. Like I said in the onset, that both antibodies and T-cells are both great. We see 100% of antibodies as well are seropositivity. The levels are modest, however. But still, nonetheless, we view that as positive. Joe, you mentioned a bunch of really interesting points, but one that I think is really, really interesting is that there's a lot of focus, I think, on sort of the challenges with mRNA technologies. Maybe it's a newer technology. It's never been approved before. There's cold temperature storage that's an issue. But there's little focus on why it's a lot better as a potential vaccine. So I want to kind of just touch on that. So one of them that you mentioned is the ability to redose patients. So for mRNA, you can redose a patient with an mRNA vaccine. If a patient takes, like you mentioned, a viral vector, that would be, for example, like an adenovirus, which would be 
the AstraZeneca or Johnson and Johnson's of the world, you would not be able to redose them and they would have to transition to an mRNA vaccine. So that is, in my mind, a huge positive. Another big positive, though, is another thing you touched on, which are these new mutations and strains that are emerging all over the country and all over the world, really. So one of the things I want to focus on is how quickly mRNA vaccine makers can pivot with these new strains coming out. So we know that changing the vaccine is really complicated. There's a number of reasons why, especially for adenovirus vaccines. Just to interject, the challenge with modifying a vaccine is usually around the delivery technology. Like we've highlighted earlier on this call, once someone has exposure to a particular delivery technology, you have to change it every time. And that takes a lot of time. I mean, a lot of time. But if you, all you have to do is change the payload, meaning you just have to modify the messenger RNA a little bit, update it, that's very, very little time. That means the delivery technology stays the same. In the case of messenger RNA vaccines, it's a lipid-mediated nanoparticle technology. So it's just a bunch of lipids that will not need to be changed. It's a redosable technology. And so that makes it considerably easier, simpler, and faster to update the technology. If there's a particular variant that just comes out of a new country that's very scary, it's very simple for the mRNA guys to just swap out the payload, update that mRNA molecule, swap it out, and continue distribution without skipping a beat. So that it's a matter of weeks, not months or years, if you have to switch up the delivery technology, for example. So if you told the mRNA guys that you had to change your delivery technology, that would throw them back a long time. But if you all you have to do is update the mRNA molecule, then it's very simple and straightforward. And that's what's attractive about the mRNA field in general. It's very flexible and quick to move to different variants if they do come up in the future, as long as you validate the platform. And that's what Arcturus is doing, is we want to validate the delivery technology, the manufacturing processes to make these vaccines. Our lyophilization process as well, which removes the water, is very important so that you can have a more stable product, an improved supply chain that does not require extraordinary freezers or dry ice handling. So that all these processes are being proven out in our phase three study because we're intending on using a lyophilized product for the phase three study. And proving that all that out, not just the delivery technology, but the manufacturing processes to make the mRNA, to make the drug product, to lyophilize it, is all proven out. So if there's a variant that comes along, all we have to do is modify that messenger RNA, which is very simple. Use the same manufacturing processes, nothing else changes, and just swap it out. And on their next run, just make another large batch of mRNA vaccine that's ready to be distributed for a particular variant. I hope that makes sense to people that this is a very attractive feature of mRNA vaccines in general. I'm curious to know your thoughts on, we're seeing some data on some of these vaccines being tested against some of these potential variants. So we know there was a study done by Pfizer and Texas Medical Branch that although it didn't include all of the potential mutations, it did include an important one, namely N501Y which is located essentially right where the receptor binding takes place. So in our view of potentially threatening the efficacy of the vaccine, but it looks like from that data, the Pfizer and BioNTech vaccines seem to be able to remain effective. However, we're finding new variants every day, including B1351. So I'm curious, firstly, do you think we're going to need some vaccine development and production to be changed for these new variants? And then secondly, we heard from Chief Ugar Sahin, who is one of the founders of BioNTech, that they'd be able to make a new vaccine for a particular COVID variant within six weeks. Do you think Arcturus's timeline would be similar for developing and manufacturing and just any challenges that you see there? I think it's helpful for whoever's listening to this to be reminded or at least informed that the messenger RNA molecules make the entire full length spike protein. So that's a very long molecule, the entire full length spike protein. So if there's a mutation in the protein here, 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 or here, 
it's okay because we're making the whole thing. So in general, our view is that the vaccine is gonna have a broad spectrum of protection because the mRNA molecule makes the full length spike protein and the antibodies for it. However, like I mentioned earlier, if the vaccine can induce a T cell response as well, that is only going to provide additional protection with respect to variant coverage because T cells are not as specific as antibodies. So T cells will have a wider spectrum of protection because of this concept in general. Did I address your question? Was there other aspects to it that you want me to? That was really helpful and really informative. I'm curious, when we talk about this 95% efficacy that we've seen from some of the companies out there, I'm curious, I wonder if people really know about how much efficacy some of their vaccines that they take currently have. The flu is a good example. That's 40 to 60% efficacious. And the Arcturus pipeline has a flu vaccine, as well as some of the other mRNA companies like Moderna. I'm curious, do you think that it's possible to achieve sort of similar to COVID-19 vaccine efficacy, or maybe this 95% threshold that we've gotten to for the flu vaccine, and maybe have even a combined mRNA vaccine for flu and COVID? Because as you mentioned, it's easy to adapt the mRNA vaccines. And so you could continue to adapt it for mutations in the flu and COVID at the same time. Can we utilize the Arcturus technology and apply it to other vaccines? Absolutely. As long as we continue to prove out the success and safety and efficacy of our vaccine candidate, assuming success, then there's no reason to believe that we cannot pursue other vaccines for other indications or other pathogens or other diseases. And the flu is on our pipeline. We have a program called Lunar-Flu, FLU. And there's a unique feature to the Arcturus technology that allows us to lower the dose level. So the dose level of other mRNA vaccines ranges up to 100 micrograms per injection. The dose level that we're pursuing in our late stage clinical trials is in the five microgram to seven and a half microgram level. So much, much lower. This has unique benefits in the flu because the flu has many more versions of it. The flu has been around a lot longer than COVID-19 and it's come up with a lot more versions. And so you need to make more versions of it in one therapeutic or one vaccine, if that makes sense. So having a lower dose level gives us more flexibility to provide more flu coverage because of the different versions of the flu and the regular mutations that are observed from it. So it gives us a unique advantage. So hopefully we'll be able to see a single administration vaccine for the flu as well. It will be interesting to see if we see a robust cellular immune response like we saw with COVID-19. This is the first we've utilized and evaluated this self-amplifying mRNA technology in humans. And we're seeing that robust cellular immune response. And hope that continues because that's the first time we've seen it. So hopefully we'll see it again with the flu. And if we do, then no doubt that will be an exciting application to the technology. Joe, I'm curious on your thoughts about distribution of vaccines. So something that I think both of us are very passionate about is global health. So I'm curious about your view on sort of the distribution to developing countries. Developing countries tend to wait a little bit longer to get their access to therapeutics that they really need, including right now during obviously this global pandemic, access to necessary vaccines. And recently, the Access to Medicine Foundation's Access to Medicine Index was just released actually today on January 26th. And so I'm just curious to know sort of your thoughts on how you see distribution going, how you think the world is kind of currently doing with vaccine distribution. The first vaccines that are being approved are being generously distributed to countries that first and foremost paid for that development. Operation Warp Speed did a great job funding some early movers, and they're going to gain access to those vaccines. And here in the United States, we're already getting vaccinated. And so you're seeing an early distribution to countries that, in essence, paid for the vaccine. There's companies that did not receive any funding from countries, and there's probably more ethical pressure on them to distribute the vaccines more broadly, and that's understandable. And so in our conversations, what we're finding is with 
will say that the wealthier countries are establishing and continue to establish supply agreements with multiple vaccine companies. As you move down to the second and third tier, we'll say less wealthy countries, those options aren't available. They haven't been able to put in place multiple supply agreements with multiple countries, as you can understand. And as we're talking to the developing nations, there's a much more increased interest in a single shot vaccine. In fact, in many countries that we talk to, a two shot vaccine isn't even feasible, frankly, because they just don't have the logistical capabilities and infrastructure to manage two shots and track it properly. So a single shot vaccine is much more attractive to the developing nations, especially. And then from a supply chain perspective, stating the obvious here, while a large percentage of the planet has access to power, a very small percentage of the planet has access to extraordinary freezing capabilities and cold chain infrastructure. So they are attracted to the Arcturus vaccine candidate, not because only because of the single shot potential, but because the vaccine is lyophilized and does not require minus 70 centigrade freezers or dry ice handling during the administrative or storage or supply chain logistical processes. You're going to see folks like J&J are going to play a key role, I believe, in vaccinating a lot of people because it's a single administration with a more attractive supply chain. And Arcturus hopes to live into that potential as well and help as many people as we can. We're a much smaller company relative to J&J. We understand that. We're only a one and a half, two billion dollar market cap company, but we still aim to help as many people as possible. We have agreements in place with Singapore and Israel, both small countries, but we're very fortunate to be working with them and have their support. And we look to add additional countries as our vaccine matures through the process. Because there's a lot of forecasting right now in terms of how many doses are going to be available this year for how many people. And those numbers move every time I read them and they're getting adjusted and corrected. We're on track to have emergency use approval sometime in the second half of this year, which is not that far away. And no doubt, if we accomplish that, there's going to be a significant number of people that will want access, stating the obvious, want access to a single shot vaccine that is readily distributed because of our supply chain profile. And also the redosability of our vaccine is going to get more and more acknowledged as important as people manage not only the pandemic, but during the endemic phase. COVID-19 doesn't go away in 2021. It's going to take a lot of years to manage this. And the last thing any country wants is for an epidemic to come roaring back because of poor vaccine management. So we hope to play a role of increasing importance as we not only navigate our way through the pandemic, but in the endemic phase as well. Whether it's transitioning viral vector recipients from 2020 and transitioning those to a non-viral vector vaccine, or it's just simply gaining access to parts of the world that are more accessible with a single shot vaccine that is lyophilized. That's certainly a hefty burden to bear, but we look forward to seeing that data. I think it's going to be really interesting. And certainly the mRNA technology and certainly Arcturus is, has a lot of really interesting differentiators. Moving sort of away from the vaccine space, because as we know, mRNA technology is beneficial for a range of different sort of categories, not only mRNA. Arcturus talks about their abilities and their capabilities with siRNA, miRNA, ASOs, and then also for gene editing, CRISPR, talons, meganucleases. These are probably words and concepts that people maybe are less familiar with. So I'd be curious to know, there's only mRNA really mentioned on your website or disclosed currently. I'd be curious if you could speak to maybe some of these technologies and also maybe give us a thought about what you're kind of thinking for disease indications and the future of your pipeline. So with respect to the all of the different types of RNA molecules out there, there's a fantastic spectrum of exciting RNA chemistry, small, medium, and large molecules, and, and you've listed many of them off. Our delivery technology at Arcturus, it's called LUNAR, L-U-N-A-R, it's a lipid-mediated nanoparticle technology. 
is proving as the data matures, our safety database for the lunar technology is looking promising, not only for intramuscular, but also for intravenously dosing the technology. So it opens up a lot of opportunities in the field of medicine and pharmaceuticals. But you're asking about capabilities of the delivery technology to deliver a whole bunch of varieties of RNA molecules, and that is indeed the case. I would like to focus the conversation going forward, though, with respect to Arcturus's lunar. It is really good at large RNA molecules, so this includes gene editing constructs, it includes replicon RNA, the self-amplifying RNA, and messenger RNA molecules that are making large proteins. This is where we see a unique advantage to the lunar delivery technology. In addition to large single RNA molecules, imagine mixtures of RNAs, the ability to have multiple SI RNAs or multiple antisense oligotherapeutics knocking down multiple targets simultaneously. If you're going to be looking at these next generation therapeutics where you're impacting multiple genetic pathways with multiple RNA molecules, you're going to have to use a technology like Lunar. So it's rather than injecting four or five needles into somebody, you have one needle where all of those RNA molecules are inside one nanoparticle. So it opens up some really interesting next generation type RNA medicines when you start thinking about what mixtures of RNA molecules you can include. An SI with a messenger RNA or gene editing with an antisense oligo or multiple of these constructs. It's an interesting platform for a scientist, no doubt, especially a creative one. You get a lot of ideas and ideas are dangerous things. Um, they can be very exciting, but we need to focus first on what we've shown, our technologies, our delivery technology to be very good at, and that's a single large RNA molecule like messenger RNA, like this self-amplifying messenger RNA. There's a lot of opportunities there that we can initially pursue, and that's captured in our pipeline. We see that we have three franchises. We have a vaccine franchise led by our COVID-19 vaccine. We have a liver franchise led by a rare liver disease called ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. And then we have a lung franchise, and that's inhaled messenger RNA that's led by an asset for cystic fibrosis. So you have three franchises led by three different assets with three different routes of administration. Intramuscular route of administration for vaccine applications, an intravenous route of administration to support liver diseases and inhaled messenger RNA to support lung diseases. And there's just an incredible amount of opportunity, many, many unmet medical need diseases there that we can make an impact on if these flagship assets are safe and effective. Yeah, and you mentioned, Joe, your OTC program, which which was your flagship program before maybe SARS-CoV-2 took over there. And as we know, OTC is a rare genetic disorder where someone is either completely missing or maybe partially missing that OTC enzyme, which is actually really important for breaking down and removing nitrogen from the body. So I'm curious if you could just speak to maybe your strategy for having this first tested in New Zealand on healthy volunteers. And since you've dosed your first patient now in the United States, any comments on how the trial is going and just on on the flagship program in general? We're very happy to be fortunate to do our phase one in New Zealand because they've handled COVID-19 better than any other country in the world. And it's just straight up luck that no one would have predicted COVID-19 in 2020. But we successfully completed phase one in New Zealand and healthy volunteers for intravenously dosing our technology. And we dosed it up to 0.4 mg per keg. These are messenger RNA therapeutics that up to 0.4 mg per keg. So that's tens of thousands of micrograms of messenger RNA. That contrasts to our COVID-19 vaccine, which is only 7.5 micrograms. Our intravenous program is dosed at much higher levels, and we've shown safety at tens of thousands of micrograms, systemically administering messenger RNA in healthy volunteers, and that's encouraging. And we did it without any steroid pretreatment. There is other lipid nanoparticle RNA therapeutics out there that can require, at certain doses, a pretreatment of steroids but we had no steroid pretreatment. 
which gives us even more flexibility to the platform as needed in the future. So we were very happy to see the safety profile of this technology in that program in 2020. We also measured and looked for the lipids to degrade rapidly. You want this delivery technology to do its job and then leave the body very quickly. And what we saw is after 48 hours, no more lipids detected. So it's a highly degradable highly biodegradable technology, which is what we wanted to see. And that's very important. The last thing you want is accumulating lipids in your liver or your lung or, or in your arm after you administer these messenger RNA therapeutics or vaccines. And we're seeing that our lunar technology degrades rapidly, which is great to tell too. And we've injected our first patient. We didn't disclose that. And we are continuing to recruit patients of this rare liver disease called ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. We hope to initiate a multi-dose trial. So instead of a single ascending dose trial, we hope to initiate a multiple dose trial in the middle of this year and establish biological proof of concept for this platform. This would be a fantastic milestone for the group and even for the field of messenger RNA therapeutics to see protein replacement after a systemically administered messenger RNA therapeutic, an intravenously dosed mRNA. This would be a big milestone for us in the field, and that's exciting. And being able to see ammonia levels drop is what we're trying to do. This therapeutic, again, it goes into the hepatocytes, these liver cells in the liver, and replaces what's missing or dysfunctional, and that's a new enzyme in these people that are missing it or have a dysfunctional version of this enzyme. If we are successful, we'll see ammonia levels drop, or there's another biomarker in this disease called erotic acid. So we could see that level drop in the urine and that could establish biological proof of concept as well. We're hoping to accomplish that this year in 2021. So thank you for asking a question about it, Ali, because not only are we building enterprise value in our vaccine franchise with COVID-19, but behind the scenes, an extraordinary commercial enterprise is opening up if we establish biological proof of concept for our liver program and our liver franchise with OTC deficiency. So did I address your question? Yes, that is perfect. I personally am very excited to see some of the data from that program. I think it's a strong unmet need with a really interesting therapeutic. So just to highlight that mRNA can be used for other things rather than just COVID-19, and it has a lot of possibilities. And with that, as you also mentioned, you have another pipeline asset, which is using mRNA for cystic fibrosis as an inhaled therapeutic. For that particular program, do you anticipate this to be a one-time cure? Is this an effort to ease symptoms? What's sort of the focus for the cystic fibrosis program? There's many different versions of cystic fibrosis. We're first going to be evaluating our therapeutic in type 1 CF. This is the most serious version. This version or type of cystic fibrosis is where they are null for the transporter. That means they have no transporter in their lungs. The transporter is called CFTR. It transports the chloride ion back and forth and maintains salt balance in their lungs. And if you're missing this transporter, then the salt balance goes out of whack. And then you have an onslaught of phlegm and inflammation and swelling and fibrotic disease and eventually the patients have extreme challenges breathing and can pass. And so it's a very serious disease, but the type 1 CF is the most serious form of it. And what these patients want, in fact, what all the CF patients want, is a normal, healthy CFTR transporter in their lungs. They all want it. They just want it to be normal. They want to have normal salt balance in their lungs. That's what they want. And our messenger RNA molecule is designed to go into ciliated bronchial epithelial cells. These are special lung cells in the lungs and build what they're missing. And that's a normal transporter. And we've seen great responses in ferrets and in primates. Now, ferrets is exciting because they are really good predictors of human lung diseases. For those that aren't aware of this, ferrets have very human-ish lungs and they're used as great models of prediction of human lung diseases. And we've shown really clear data that we're functionally delivering messenger RNA molecules into the lungs of ferrets. And we're also showing the same thing in primates, which is also a good predictor of human lung disease. So we've announced our development candidate in December. 
So we've selected a development candidate and now we're, as we go through 2021, we want to engage and complete the IND enabling studies, all these studies that you need to complete for the FDA or for a CTA in Europe, for example. And we're engaged in those processes throughout this year. And we aim to get a CTA or an IND in place by the end of 2021. And you can understand why we're excited about it, because if the CF program is an enormous commercial opportunity, type 1 CF is completely neglected right now. There's no treatments for this type of cystic fibrosis. And so we're really looking forward to helping these folks as well. And it represents the entire lung franchise, this product. We've counted 80 diseases we can go after with limited competition if this program works for cystic fibrosis. So it opens up a huge platform opportunity where all you have to do, you don't have to change anything, you just swap out the payload and you can do multiple therapeutics in the lung with inhaled messenger RNA. So that completes basically the Arcturus's pipeline alley. We've talked about the vaccine franchise and the liver franchise, but now also the lung franchise and the enormous commercial opportunity that each of these assets represent as a platform, three different platforms in one company. It's going to be an exciting company to watch, at least from my view. We're really excited. Yeah, really interesting. And with interesting commercial and scientific assets, I'm always curious about the intellectual property landscape. So I'm curious if you had any thoughts about sort of the IP landscape for mRNA therapeutics. Well, delivery is absolutely essential. Let me start with the delivery concept. We've been coming back to this a few times in this one podcast, but without delivery technology, messenger RNA is useless. The blood destroys it, the saliva destroys it. So if you inject naked messenger RNA molecules, they get destroyed very quickly by the blood and or the saliva. In order to enable the power of mRNA, you need a safe, effective delivery technology. And the delivery technologies are lipid-mediated nanoparticles. So if you look at the structures of these lipids, they have to be novel, proprietary. And Arcturus is very strong IP with respect to our delivery technology. We do not utilize glycerol-based lipids or carbon-based lipids. We infuse heteroatoms into the cores of our lipids, like nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. And these provide additional handles for the body to chew on these lipids and degrade them rapidly. And that's a differentiating feature of our delivery technology is that after it's completed delivering the messenger RNA, these lipids degrade rapidly. And that's very important to prevent accumulation of lipids. And so our IP around the structure, it's called composition of matter IP, around our lipids is very strong and multiple degrees of freedom away from others in the space. So we're in a good position there. We also have IP around the design and synthesis and manufacturing of messenger RNA molecules and self-amplifying messenger RNA IP. And there's a lot of design features that go into these molecules that we've filed applications for. And on the manufacturing of these molecules, just amazing innovation. Arcturus has been a small company. We didn't have the good fortune of raising copious amounts of money in the early history of the company. So we had to address our challenges through innovation to reduce costs. And we've just made tremendous progress over the last few years in manufacturing messenger RNA, especially pertaining to purification of these large molecules has been an enormous challenge even five, 10 years ago. And so we have IP or intellectual property around that. So as we go through the entire drug product now, you'll see that there's multiple layers of IP. This is not our grandparents' pharmaceutical, where there's relatively thin number of patents to protect it. We've got multiple layers of patents protecting our therapeutics and vaccines from a delivery perspective, composition of matter, drug formulation processes, manufacturing and designing of the mRNA and incorporating these two together and method of use patents. So that was a long way of saying we have, I'd say a firewall of IP around each of our therapeutics that will present it not only challenging for competitors, but even as going forward 10, 15, 20 years when generics to genericize these types of therapeutics would be very challenging as well because of just the layers of intellectual property involved. 
That's really helpful, Joe. I'm sure it's going to be an ever-evolving landscape for IP. I'd be curious to know your thoughts on mRNA therapeutics in five to 10 years. Where do you see the technology going? I'm very bullish on mRNA in general. I think the opportunity for this space is tremendous because mRNA is a disruptive technology. It's actually replacing and building proteins in the therapeutics landscape. So the bulk of the pharmaceutical industry, if you look at what it does, is it suppresses the downstream effects of disease. So they're focused on reducing pain, reducing inflammation, fixing blood pressure, dealing with the cancers. But all the causes of these disease are farther back and they have genetic roots. So if you can go to the ultimate genetic cause and replace what's missing, then all those other drugs go away. Again, I'm going to say this, like if you build and replace what's missing, what's causing the disease, then all the drugs that people are taking go away. So this is very disruptive. This is not improving someone's life by three months or modifying some sort of signal by 10% or 15%. No, this is correcting the disease. If we can replace what's missing, it'll change these lives dramatically. So it's disruptive to the patients and it's disruptive to the field of pharmaceuticals if mRNA works like it's intended. And right now I can speak at Arcturus, we're looking at three intramuscular injections for vaccine applications in the world is coming of age right now and seeing that mRNA can make a big impact in vaccines. But looking beyond vaccines to the liver, there's dozens of diseases where people are missing something or have a dysfunctional something in the liver that we can address through intravenous applications of mRNA to the liver. And then if you go to the lungs, imagine the laundry list of diseases that we can address for people that are missing something in their lungs, that we can just simply inhale a messenger RNA therapeutic and replace it. And all that phlegm and fibrotic disease and pain and inflammation and disease goes away and all the drugs they're taking go away with it. And that's what's disruptive about it. So you have a lot of interest in mRNA space right now, and I think that interest is only gonna grow. So in five to six years from now, I see multiple approved products by multiple different companies. There's fantastic companies in the space, Moderna, BioNTech, Translate Bio, CureVac. These are all great, fantastic companies. We know their teams well. I have no doubt that as a group, as a community of companies that we will deliver on the promise of messenger RNA. That I feel very comfortable about. That's great, Joe. For me, this has been really, really fantastic. I've definitely learned a lot and I'm super interested to see where the Arcturus story and also where the mRNA story continues to grow. So thanks so much for joining us today and everyone have a great day. Yeah, thanks, Ali. Great to be with you as always. Welcome back. And Thanks, Ali. Two fascinating conversations. I am certain that we will be hearing more about mRNA in the future. Definitely. It's a really interesting technology that I think will have broad applicability in the future. So looking forward to seeing more data. And thank you very much for joining the For Your Innovation podcast. Look forward to interesting conversations and interviews in the future. Thanks. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.